It's okay. Oh. Hi, everybody. Hi. 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 My camera doesn't work properly, so <laughs> I cannot use it right now. Guy Tolga Hoja is Tolga, okay. Is my voice clear? Uh, yes, Tolga, we hear you. Okay. So there are some more people coming. Meanwhile, um, I'm in no hurry. If you guys are okay, I'm in no hurry. I mean, I'm in no hurry. Okay, I'm let's start slowly, slowly. Okay. It's fine. Dear guests, dear friends, dear students and colleagues, welcome to our second Thursday Talks. We called this series of webinars as uh, Global Thursday Talks on Education because last week, last Thursday, as you remember, we hosted Peter McLaren and uh, we listened to him and then of afterwards, uh, we received a lot of uh, feedback, positive feedback about his talk and we continue uh, to share documents, for example, to share ideas afterwards. Uh, and today's talk will be given by our dearest friend, our dearest colleague, Guy Sinis, our friend, our very, very dearest friend, and I'm very excited again to, to host him here and to share this screen uh, with him and with you. But before, before I leave the floor to Eda, our moderator, I'd like to quote something from uh, Guy Sini's interview with me in 2016, yeah. where I was where I was in Chapman, and I made an interview with him, and then this was translated into uh, Turkish and then published in Critical Pedagogy Journal. In the beginning of this interview, he told me. Fatma, I spend all my time working trying to get students to find the base of their moral, their social commitments at heart. And this is their philosophy of ideas in education. And it is good because it is the teacher's conscience that makes change. So he's a believer in teachers, he's a believer in students, and he's a believer in in how to say, in consciousness and teachers' consciousness and teachers' responsibilities about their children, about their, their students, because he knows that these students will, will build future, will construct future. So uh, if you are interested in, you can find this interview in Turkish, uh, published in Critical Pedagogy, uh, journal. So there are so many, so many things to talk about, you know, uh, all positive things about Guy, our friendship, our memories, our experience together, both in intellectual level and friendship level. And he is the dearest, you know, supporter of our, you know, difficult times. We know these, we, we have so many things, but now I want to leave the floor to Eda. Eda, floor is yours. Thank you, Guy, for becoming for us, with us. Thank you very much. It is amazing to see uh, lots of you know friends from Guy's class and uh, from different institutions, as you say. And uh, I, again, feel really lucky and honored to be a part of this evening. Fatma Ojam and Guy Sinise have both been amazing mentors for me, uh, intellectuals, as a learner and as a teacher, I would like to say. As you know, uh, Dr. Mizukacı, I would like to introduce uh, our host and uh, speaker quickly. 
Dr. Muskaji specialized in higher education systems, policies, curriculum, and instruction. Her main research interests include European and international higher education, privatization, and higher education policies in Turkey. And Guy Sneez is Professor Emeritus in Social Foundations and Leadership in the College of Education at Northern Arizona University. He has published in the fields of Native American education, critical theory and pedagogy, and autoethnographic critical studies in education. Professor Sneez is uh, a co-author of Simulation, Spectacle and the Ironies of Education Reform. He is the author of Self-Determination and the Social Education of Native Americans and Throwing Voices, Five Autoethnographies on post surgical Education and the Fine Arts of Miss direction. And along with the, those, uh, he has some publications in Educational Theory, the Journal of Critical Education Policy Studies, Education Foundations, and Harvard Educational Review. And uh, Guy Sneez uh, visited Ankara University in 2013, and uh, I was one of the lucky <coughs> students uh, actually taking the course called Intellectual Foundations of Public Education. And then in 2018, uh, he was faculty associate at Middle East Technical University and Fulbright Fellow to Ankara University, as I mentioned. And Professor Sneez is the recent co-editor of The Language of Freedom and Teachers Authority, Case Comparisons from Turkey and the US. And uh, Yasemin Hocam uh, is also here, along with Fatma Hocam. This it is a you know, um, very valuable book as well for us. Sneez is past president of the Midwest History of Education Society and received his PhD in Educational Policy Studies, the MA in Social Studies Education at the University of Illinois, and uh, he has a baccalaureate in philosophy at Northern Illinois University. He taught at high school level as well in Arizona, and recently he's an active member in Salt of the Earth, and um, thank you for showing up again from different cities, different institutions, and even different countries. Before we start here, I would like to uh, come up with some overall reminders for a better uh, webinar. So um, in order to have a quality voice, actually, please stay mute and feel free to use the chat box to type your questions and comments. You can send a message to me privately or you can just type your message to everyone. And uh, we collected some questions from you actually and we shared it with a uh, guy. So there will be a question and answer part at the end of the talk. So please type your questions as you listen as well if you would like to uh, share. Even if time constraint is a problem, we are going to make sure that Professor Sneeze sees them later on. And the talk has two parts today. Uh, firstly, uh, Professor Sneez will talk about the pandemic in general and its implication regarding education and social justice. And then we'll also mention George Floyd protests in the US. And uh, the talk will probably take around an hour. And with that, I present you our one and only Guy Sneez. Thank you, Ada. It's a... Uh, uh, I don't feel so homesick now. I see everybody. <laughs> so many friends. <laughs> and uh, thank you. And I hope I do this justice, uh, this effort to, uh, it just makes me feel so, so great to see you, you guys organizing in uh, this, 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 this topic series. And uh, so much more I could talk about. You know me, I'm, I'm, I'm in, sort of informal in the way I work with friends and people and teaching, but I'm going to present a, I'm going to present a, um, a piece of work that I've done. And um, I've sent the uh, copy of the, the draft, it's a draft um, of the work to, um, to Fatma and Ada, and they can share it, um, uh, what I'll be reading from. It's a short paper. And I've also got some fo photos that I'm going to share on my screen. And I, I hope this uh, works okay. I apologize in advance for mistakes I make in uh, understanding 
from my work today, but uh, I, I've done my uh, best. I look forward to talking with you more than at you, but let me start. So uh, I surely am honored yet flattered to be invited to talk on the subject of social justice, the George Floyd protests, and COVID-19, the glo global viral plague. <laughs> they are interwoven. I am really proud that I have been a professor, but more proud that I began as a public school social studies teacher. I'm a leftover from a time when everything seemed possible, <laughs> and then nothing did. I started out as a high school teacher, and I always try to keep in mind when I work in my field, the students who are in my classes, the long line of students that stand behind all of you and support the work you do in your colleges. <coughs> so this reheated high school teacher is going to talk about the price of pandemic and the price of racism. Over the six years since I came to Ankara University as a Fulbright Fellow, many things have changed in Turkey, certainly, in the US, certainly. It was a global outreach. Two years ago, I returned to Ankara and worked at Middle Eastern Technical University, Oktu, to do more of the same kind of work. This is community building at its, uh, at its best and it was created by you all and your invitation. It's been the most valuable and enduring work of my entire life. <clears throat> it is gratifying. I started writing this paper at a Burger King. It's a hamburger restaurant. You may have one. <clears throat> It's on the south side of our town, Tucson. The workers in there are all people of color, mostly Latino, one black man. He's a general manager. I sat there and wrote all day, and I asked them questions. I thought about my talk, and I thought about them, and I thought about their children, and I thought about their schools that they attend, and how their teachers are dealing with this world of pandemic and increasing poverty. The general manager said he makes about $32,000 a year. Uh, I saw him. He wears a tie and it has a crown on it, but he is not a king. For every time he's driving, he sees the lights of a police car behind him and his heart jumps into his throat. The other workers make less than $10 an hour. They can barely make their rent, bills, car payments, child care. Some of them are immigrants and have no citizenship. When they're driving to work and they see the lights of a police car, their hearts also jump into their throats. They're all the type of service workers whose children populate our schools. <coughs> They're the type of service workers whose children populate your schools. There are almost 12,000 Burger King restaurants in 100 countries. These service employees and their counterparts in health, elder care, child care, including teachers, barely make ends meet. And now the struggle is extraordinarily harder at every level. On the other hand, the owners, including the big stockholders who make the real money from our burgers, don't send their kids to public school. They're in the top one to 5% of the wealthy. Their wealth has doubled since 2008. If you actually work at Burger King, work in Burger King, your income to debt ratio, your salary measured against the cost of living have both gone down. So I'm going to tell a story that starts in that Burger King. 
and I'm going to tell it using my telephone camera. It's a revolutionary device, and it's the only reason I'm talking to you today. For it was on such a device that the murders of black men, more than 20 of them in the past five years since I was in Ankara, were caught on camera. So back in 2014, when I came to Ankara University, thanks to another friend, Hassan Aksoy, he invited and hosted me and my wife, Jamie, who has been with me uh, shoulder to shoulder in all of this. In October of the semester, I was asked to give a talk by a then student in my class, Yasmin Tezgiden Kachak, who I hope is here today, about an event that affected teachers, particularly teacher education students half a world away, but near where I came from, Tucson, Arizona, near the Mexican border. It was a talk about the 43. They're called the 43. Their poor rural area of Ayotzinapa had a teacher's college. They were progressive students. Most were Marxists. And they were going to a big rally in Mexico City to an annual celebration of their comrades who a generation before had been killed by the Mexican police while protesting injustice. Many had been teachers at that time. Well, those kids on the way to that event, the police stopped them too. And they were never heard from again. This happened in September. Just a couple of months, my Turkish students in room five heard about it and were curious and asked me to give a talk, give a talk on it. I know Yasemin was a facilitator in all of that. <clears throat> they heard about it before I did. They cared. That told me something about Turkish students that I have never forgotten. I discovered the 43, like tens, hundreds of thousands of citizens, activists, knowledge workers, They were murdered, disappeared in Mexico, in Central America. Those police worked for the ruling classes who supported by the US Central Intelligence Agency worked hard to jail or kill anyone who threatened American and American allied business interests. This is the photo that I showed to class. <laughs> And I trust that you can see it, and I hope you can see it okay. Yes, yeah, it's okay. It's perfect. I talked about those 43, but that other image in the photo, photo, I put that there because it was a photo of a young black man, a new high school graduate, who was murdered by police in much the same way as George Floyd. And since then, 20 other public photos have shown evidence of police murder by a, a, a victims in custody. The victims were black. Two days ago, another black man was killed. He was shot twice in the back while fleeing. Yesterday, seven black men were found around the country hanging each has been determined by police a suicide. We are beyond a crisis. I cannot tell which virus is spreading faster, COVID or racist murder. I can't tell because now they're working together. The world press is overflowing with reports of solidarity with the Floyd protests and I just want to mention a couple. As I studied in the Burger King yesterday, thanks to the World Wide Web, which the King allows, along with your burgers, I saw the number of countries. The Atlantic Magazine has a 
I'll spread an article which is included in my paper that you can see. 43 countries, I'm sorry, 36 countries, activism has exploded. I just picked one and to talk about. Campaigners across the Balkans in Central Europe held a series of rallies in recent day to show their solidarity. And I'm thinking, they're in the Balkans. How are they feeling this? Anti-racism demonstrations have been held in several cities, also in the, the Polish capital in recent days, inspired by nationwide protests here, and they have spread worldwide. <clears throat> the press reads that they are in solidarity to protest racism and police violence in their own countries. <clears throat> to draw attention to the local context, An NGO, Women in Black and Civic Action from the Serbian city of Panchevo organized a solidarity action under the slogan, Justice for George Floyd on Monday in Belgrade. <clears throat> Perpetrators of racially inspired killings, an end to the use of force, and an end to the criminalization of anti-fascist pro protesters. Dozens of people took part in a protest in Montenegro. There's no doubt, they say, that racists are also hiding among all our local Balkan fascists. That's why George, George Floyd is also ours. And it goes on. It's one example. And I think about how do they feel? Well, maybe those folks in that area, those teachers, those activists, they feel because they can relate in different ways. For example, they wrote, together we must fight for a brighter future with the hope for peaceful, anti-racist and inclusive society built on mutual respect, justice, equality. Mikhail Mishev, a member of the Roma Standing Conference, told the protest in the Bulgarian capital for the Roma have also been targets in ways that people here can't understand. I picked this one article just because of the passion for freedom and justice that fills it. In countries like many whose moralities have been totally transformed from the natural slavery of the occupying Roman Empire and the generations in that area of servitude, slavery to kings, sultans, and oligarchs. Yet even with this in these same nations, there is now an ominous new rise of race hate directed at immigrants, migrants, the Roma. The smell of fascism is everywhere. The new oligarchs with their close ties to corporate exploiters immiserate their populations for profit turn the fear and resentment of their service employees insecure into fear and resentment directed toward violence and away from their own exploitation towards scapegoats, immigrants, socialists, not back toward the elites who create this illusion. And I caught this one, worth mentioning in Turkey. Turks protest in Istanbul against police killing of un unarmed U.S. black men, etc., etc. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, I found this on a Chinese news source. <clears throat> the crowd gathered in front of the Trump Tower in Sicily, district of European side of the largest Turkish city, chanting slogans against the killing of Floyd. And it goes on in a very similar fashion. Institutional racism in the U.S. is mentioned. Several protesters in Istanbul wrote Floyd's last words, I can't breathe, over their own masks. This webinar is what I like to call simply uh, a democratic project. 
And like any project, it's full of hope, but also full of challenge. For the massive scope of our new challenges make us feel small, no matter how big we are. However, it is the very sense of community and communication and communal affection that builds a life that's worth living. This is a project that organizes. I've always liked to think about the socialist activists in the early American labor movement whose memory was rubbed out in our schools and who I had to be reminded about in Turkey. Especially the industrial workers of the world, the IWW or the Wobblies, they were idealists, romantics maybe. But their organization was among the most open, the most unbiased of all the organizations for labor. Blacks, women, all others were welcome in one big union. And I've loved borrowing that term for any efforts that I'm a part of and that I can share. The Wadley writer, artist, singer, and organizer, Joe Hill, is remembered for his own death at the hands of police. He was shot by a Utah fire firing squad on a phony charge for his activism. But on his last day before being shot, he told his weeping followers, don't waste time mourning me, boys. Organize. The term, don't mourn, organize, has energized activists around the world in difficult times. And for that, I am proud to be a countryman of Joe Hill. In Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, it was written in that generation, and Tom Joad is a, is a character who is transformed also. How? By being among, being with those who suffered during the Depression. By living shoulder to shoulder with workers, seeing their families hurt, including his own, he is transformed from a minor criminal, from a minor player. And Steinbeck shows him, talking to his mother. His mother says, as he begins to leave after his transformation, to go out and to organize. She says, oh, Tom, <clears throat> where are you going? How, how, will I, how will I be able to find you? And he says, I'll be where there's people fighting so those kids can eat. Ma, where people are eating the food they raise, I'll be there. And where there's a guy getting beaten up by a cop, I'll be there too. I think, no, I know it helps to take ourselves as teachers out of our relative comfort in a position to live at least part of the time suffering for even a moment what the oppressed suffer. Last year, thousands of migrants swept through my area in the Southwest. They came from Guatemala and Honduras. They were the victims and have been the victims of the racist terror that has emerged by the complete destabilization of their e local economies. This is a destabilization orchestrated by my own country. My wife, Jamie, worked daily with them. She's a trained social worker. I went there too, but I had no skills. I couldn't speak Spanish like she could. Without those skills, I just picked up garbage. <laughs> but I saw those kids, just like any kids, horsing around, having fun. I saw the worried parents they left everything behind, whispering to each other. As I write this, now there are thousands who are in jail, incarcerated near Mexico in camps. They're victims of our own nation's broken promise to help the refugee. And these are refugees that my country created. <clears throat> They've been broken by the vicious libertarians who orchestrated also the neoliberal reaction. 
the excursion of hate and exclusion that we live with. This is a photo that the staff put up in that church where those children and those parents were. And it's a picture that's just one of a hundred. It's just a little picture of home, two homes in Guatemala. Not just that picture, although it breaks my heart to think of the hundreds that were also on that wall. It improved my vision, that picture, but more so being there with them improved my vision. I have a better imagination for what it's like for them and for like any child and for any child who might be there in a classroom, a world alien from me. So this is difficult for me, but it's also easy to share with friends who have been um, with me as I have grown and who have helped me grow. <clears throat> was I, when I, as I wrote this, I stayed up all night because I just, I loved what I was doing. Uh, I was writing and I looked up on my wall and I looked at a photo another photo that I don't have here. It's a photo in my office. And it was a gift from a student who was in my class in Ankara six years ago. I won't forget him. And I think about all the young people around the world it represents. And those millions of young people who are in the streets today, every day, and have been threatened with rubber bullets, tear gas, the weapons of war in their own streets. It's a picture, you may have seen it. It's a skinny kid alone on the street facing an armed water cannon. And he's armed only with a guitar. The Gezi protests seemed like they were the beginning of a revolution. <coughs> I'm plug in my battery. Pardon me. Bye. Meanwhile, can I can I add something here? You sure. know, uh, at the background, while you you are speaking, at the background we are having some messages from our friends, from our Turkish friends, educators, teachers. They say they become very emotional. They become very, very affect, you know, influenced by your speak, by your, you know, the themes you you pointed out here. Just I wanted to share this. Oh, really? No. Oh. I'm sorry, and I'm happy. And I feel the same way. A couple of times I caught myself. Thank you for sharing that. I just. I hope I'm okay to go on. Um, yes, yes, please. So, so I'm sitting in my study <laughs> and I'm looking at that skinny kid and I'm thinking about what Angela Davis has recently said a lifetime black activist, socialist, and organizer and educator professor, teacher. She's so hopeful that this moment will be revolutionary. She's so hopeful. Angela Davis, if you've heard her speak, doesn't throw hope around easily, but she is so hopeful. But I have to think from my time in Turkey and looking at that boy, uh, Turkish audiences can't be forgiven if they might not share Davis's hope right now. What stemmed from the Gezi protests, which shook Turkey then, and shook the world. Well, it has gone off the tracks a bit. It's put a place on back on that long arc that bends toward justice of Dr. King. Yes, hope, but when, but when. She may be right, but hope for revolution. I, maybe like you, I'm not so sure. 
<sighs> the reactionaries are here are starting already. They're apologizing and making the critique of police brutality a crime against the nation. Armed militias are empowered and brought into our nation's capital. They are facing off as military, not police, against their own citizens. Yes, around the country and the world, I see, statues to oppressive colonialists and slaveholders are coming down. Guy, can, can I interrupt, please? Anytime. Um, there's a problem in your voice system. It, it was better, you know, before you... You put on your battery. Okay. Is it better? I did the same. Now I get a growl when you guys talk. It's kind of a growl sounding. Yes. It, yes, exactly. I hear it too. Can you understand me? Yes, I I can understand you, but you know it's not as effective. There is a there is a call. There is Can you give me that other, please? There's a, so this is a one chord. I have another chord in there. Maybe that's a better chord. Yeah, maybe it's a chord. Yeah. I'll try a different chord. If I continue to talk a little bit, can you hear me? Yes, no? yes, I, I, I can hear you, but you know, it, it can be it's not very clear. Your your voice is not very clear. Sorry, Ada. I know. Uh, maybe the battery. Uh, maybe it's slower. I mean, talking a bit slower might help, as we are trying to fix the issue. Hmm. Okay, maybe slower. Thanks. So I'll try a different, a different connection. Is that any better? Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's better it's now. Better. It sounds better. Please. <laughs> electricity. <laughs> Sorry, that's closer. But sometimes support electricity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, now. <laughs> Let me jump forward just a bit. Ten forty one. So I'm going to summarize a little bit of what my talk in the middle and just pick out some highlights. Okay. This is a quote. Um, it came uh, from uh, another friend of mine. Was, um, it comes from the People's World Journal. His name is Joe Burnick. He's the director of the Salt of the Earth Labor College, where I work and help. He wrote, <clears throat> Donald Trump said yesterday, after calls, even from within the military, to take away all the signs of slavery, the names of enslavers who are on our military bases, the names on our bases. He said he would not even consider renaming them. They are traitors to the idea of freedom. 
and yet they will stand if it has if it's up to him and his group. <clears throat> his racist declarations on Twitter recently. Some were uh, were bald reinforcements of the racism that to be a good patriot in America you should adopt. And if you don't adopt, you are with the press and with all teachers and with anyone in solidarity with human beings, you are a traitor. It is you who are a traitor. The statue of an old racist slaveholder and politician Jefferson Davis came down in the capital of the Old South. Within hours, Trump said in a tweet, our history as the greatest nation in the world will not be tampered with. Respect the military. Trump is a leader. He is a point man. He is a messenger boy. He does not have the intellect to comprehend the libertarian movement that he fronts. He is an entertainer. <clears throat> he earns, he's an earner. The mafia likes to call a valued member. He's a good earner. Oh, Donald Trump is a good earner for his class. They, this libertarian, beyond conservative movement, they would bend light itself away if from a fact, if it interfered with their right to make profit and power. They would bend light itself toward a lie if it would help the cause of their own power. The denial of truth and denial of facts have infected my nation. Every country in the modern world, nearly every country, I won't go into detail with all of them, has seen COVID balanced, possibly dropping, leveling off, still having a terrible effect. The only one that is growing is my own country. Why is this happening? It is because any effect, any effort to interfere with workers taking the front lines, all workers in service taking the front lines, risking their lives, all of that work is demanded as a patriotic act. It is not a patriotic act. It is a method to ensure that the stock market, the owners of the means of distribution, consumption, production, does not get frightened and suddenly take wealth from the mouths and the hands of people like Donald Trump. In our country, Trump's made it nearly impossible to get information about hard evidence. He wanted workers and wants them to ignore. He's punished state governments who locked down and helped many of them to ignore. The burden fell on medical workers who are dying, who are getting sick. Those same workers are like the workers at Burger King. They make about the same amount of money. They also cannot make ends meet. Their kids, I think about their kids because it's my job. It's easy to forget. <clears throat> we began to see the right wing resistance and a culture war that is blending these twin crises, racism and pandemic. In another case of madness, 
It has become a culture war in my country to wear a mask. To wear a mask in certain circles is to be a traitor. You must be a warrior. Donald Trump has said, you must be the front line and you must be warriors. Well, what war are you fighting? For him and his followers, they like to think it's a war to support the idea that is America. In fact, the idea that is America, if any idea matters, is the idea of human equality. <clears throat> Donald Trump has supported fascists in Charlottesville, Virginia. He's called them some very good people as they murdered a young woman. He injured many others. <laughs> He's attacked governors who, with their shelter-in-place orders, and encouraged armed militias to go to their state capitals and protect the liberty of their people. This militarization of the police has continued, but it's not continued in isolation. Soldiers began showing up at the Floyd rallies, but they wear only service clothing, military clothing, no badges, no signs. Who do I represent? They came because Trump invited them. The lies are compounded, and they're compounded by what has become our state media, Fox News. For seven weeks, Donald Trump had the air. His ministers and Trump have refused to wear face masks and on and on. Here in Arizona, where I live, this death rate is skyrocketing. So, what's a teacher to do? Well, I think some of it has to do with hope. I know you have a great poet, Nazim Hikmet, who talks about hope, and maybe it's the only thing left, and maybe if it is, maybe we should hang on to it. Hmm. Hope, however, begins in community, begins in shared fear and shared courage. It has to do with sympathy, not pity, sympathy, with identification, with knowing someone. For us teachers, that means knowing, really knowing, who those kids are from those people. Now, <clears throat> some of the work that I try to do is to close the gap between people because I believe in it. And, you know, this photo, this nice cover that you see um, uh, with the picture of the little little child on our book, it's a story in itself. It's a gift from a Russian artist who charged nothing for us to use it. But in class one day, we were reading and talking about the word that's also um, the structure of a poem by Rohan Veli. It's called Bedava. And we we're talking about that as part of the language of freedom in Turkey. And now, for me here, for my students, anyhow. So, you know, I asked the students in our class <coughs> to write a, um, to do a little assignment where they wrote down what do you think when you see this little boy or girl with a nest? on his head or her head. And I kept this, I took a picture of this assignment. I kept it all this, all this time because I really love it. And I, and I also, I love the memory of those kids. Now there are about 20 comments and they wrote them one after another and folded them up in an old <coughs> surrealist um, activity that I thought they would find fun. But I so make them think. And I said, what do you see in this? And I just like, this is, there's so much in here with these, that these 
and I call them kids. They weren't kids, they're college students at Metu. But they're young, they're kids to me. And I just love this one line. One student said, even if you were afraid of making any risky steps, you have to do it. If you do not try, you definitely will lose. If you do not try, you will lose. If you try, there is a chance. Trying, and you will definitely regain experience. So, I am emotional reading this. I remember many of those students. The child and the bird, they talk about it. And they talk about what this could mean for freedom. What do children have to do with freedom? I'm going to talk about a couple other photos. And I like this one. I really made many, many of them, maybe, maybe a thousand, I don't know. But I knew, even back then, that this magical phone was, in, it for me, a revolution in knowledge. It allowed me to keep track. It allowed me to keep track and to tell stories, which is the heart of sympathy and education. So here's a picture. You can all see it. One of many. And now there are three figures in it. There's a woman walking away. She looks like a young woman. There's a sign, an advertisement. And there's a man with a tie and a white shirt. He looks like, to me, a middle manager somewhere. You guys would understand this and know this. You could also imagine who hired his family, his children. They go to your schools. The teachers in training to work with his kids are in your classrooms. And you know him in a way I could never know him. And in the far distance, this man, six years ago, I was mystified. I thought, what an exotic figure. He's a man from this part of the world. He's carrying a huge load on his head. I thought it was so impressive that anybody could walk with that number of things on. I didn't know then, like I do now, that those things are really delicious. In fact, I wish I had one right now. He's carrying a stack of about 200 simit on his head. Now, how would I think about this man? Not just him, because it's my job. About his family, his kids. Who are they? I can ask you the question right now. Who are his kids? What is their identity? Guy, yes. Guy, I just noticed something in the in the advertisement, the big one, with and the man with, with a with a tie. All right. Uh, it asks for it's a call for a job for students, daily okay. sixty Turkish lira. So the advertisement uh, calls calls for students to work daily 60 Turkish Lira. What's interesting, Fatma, is that it looks to me like that's a handbill that is stuck on that advertisement. And we can talk about it later. Yeah. <laughs> and you know better than me what 60 Turkish Lira buys. Now, who are these people? Unless I know them deeply, that woman, those men, and their families and their kids, I can't hope to do critical pedagogy. I can't hope to, not even the beginnings of it, in my opinion. Who are they? How can I relate to them? And I'll go on, I'll go on to my next photo. 
It's a photo of the door at uh, Kutufane Library in Otu. <clears throat> Two years ago, I was there. By then, I, know, I knew how good Summit was. <laughs> and I knew a few more things, but not many. Still, I did know something, though. It demonstrated a lively political atmosphere. It was not untrue when I was in Ankara. It was lively, I'll say, in the smell of tear gas. It was also in the air. <clears throat> now, I, I was sitting two years ago just inside that entrance. <clears throat> and I knew that I could walk to another place. There's a place on that campus with the word revolution, Gavrin, that's as large as a cruise ship. <laughs> Yasemin showed me that when I first came to campus and told me its story. Today, I think about how odd this looks in a, in a football stadium. But there's not something odd about how I think about it now, particularly. <coughs> because across our country, there is a war going on for the soul of athletics. <coughs> a freedom warrior, a football player, who is making millions of dollars, one day during our national song, our national anthem, at a game, he kneeled down. He refused to stand for our national anthem. He was protesting the killing after killing after killing after killing. Colin Kaepernick did that. He's a black athlete. His career was instantly ended. His career as a, as a warrior for justice began. <clears throat> Trump and his supporters, including the commissioner of the football league, condemned him. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, he took a knee. And today, around the world, people are thinking about the knee on George Floyd's neck. For that knee taking, the one knee down, that's the same posture that killed George Floyd that started this revolution in our cultural understanding of what it is to be a patriot, to be a man even. Now, this next picture, and I only have a couple more pages, and then we can talk a little bit. <clears throat> when I was in the, when I was in the um, Burger King, I thought about this picture, but I didn't have it in front of me, and I thought, <clears throat> she was reading a book. This, I remember her, because she is placed, or was placed, maybe it's changed, right inside that door with all the political slogans and pages outside the library. Inside that door is another door, and it's a revolving door. I sat just inside that revolving door watching kids come and go on their phones, through and back and through, revolving, revolving in and out of that library. And the thought occurs to me today, coming in that library, going out, what is being lost? What is being gained? Is that a revolution to use upon? <laughs> Actually, when I look at it, it's a more complicated picture. She's looking ahead, and it looks to me like she might be on her cell phone. She's got one finger in her ear. ear. <clears throat> Maybe she's organizing a protest on her phone. <clears throat> and it looks like the book may be falling out of her lap. 
Well, I hope not. At any rate, she is the counterpart of the reading woman in Kizilai. <laughs> sort of a modern counterpart. <clears throat> now, I look at her, and I thought about what I gained sitting there that day. <clears throat> that day. I think of the lady in our other picture with the smidgen and the the candle and the guy in the what and the white tie. The woman walking away. Where is she walking? Who is she? I don't know. <clears throat> but she's a student in your class. <laughs> or could be. <clears throat> or if you're a primary school teacher, her kid is a student in your class. <clears throat> she's going somewhere. Where is she going? <clears throat> Is she a shop girl? What is her status? What is her salary? Is she trying to make ends meet as a single mom? <clears throat> Does she have kids? You know her better than I do. And right now, <clears throat> you can think, do I know her? Okay, let's just imagine. She just got off the bus from Istanbul. I'm, I'm doing time travel now. She and her friends <clears throat> went to there to be in solidarity with George Floyd protests. She'll come back and go to class and tell her friends and opera about it. She'll probably tell them, however, on Facebook. What will she say? What can she say? The whole world is watching? We're watching in Turkey? Who in Turkey stands for George Floyd? Who is standing for George Floyd and why? I think about that. Where does this solidarity come from? And what endangers it? What endangers it? What makes it less likely to become part of a new kind of revolution? So, things, things are more difficult. My mentor, the person who first introduced me to the conference on critical pedagogy and why I first went to Turkey, his name was Richard Drozio. Richard said, and he was a fine theoretician and a brilliant scholar of progressive left Marxist theory. But Richard said, you can have all that, but if you don't get in there and know the physics of things and talk to students about their physics, and by physics he didn't mean the subject, he meant their bodies, their lives, their income, their pain. If you didn't do that, things will never get better. You will never be a teacher who is a critical pedagogue. So things, what do they look like for your students? How do you know them? Does their status bother you? Are you afraid to talk to them or go to where they were? Will it be a reflection on your own status? That's real question. And that's true for every middle class civil servant who serves as a teacher everywhere in the world. We are part of an ambiguous class. We serve revolution, but at the same time, we serve our families in the effort to maintain some semblance of a decent life. That decent life would we, which we would like our students to have. <coughs> so, Things are difficult. More are sick. More are unemployed. More are working now, like you, in an automated workplace where the autonomy you enjoy, the ability to do what I did in Turkey, has been challenged by the tremendous pressure on teachers to work daily, online, five, six, more classes. It's happening here 
in my university, and also hundreds of low paid workers, teacher workers, are being fired with no due process, with no questions asked to the faculty. It's done by managers, somewhat like the way a district manager fires the managers, the assistant managers, and the employees at a burger camp. Knowing their lives, their income, their strengths, their pains. When I was teaching, I tried to do little pieces of that, that lesson I gave. At one point, I tried to embody the idea of a child in a class who is excluded. And I improvised. I put a garbage can into my classroom. I didn't plan it, but I saw that the way children are treated is very much like being seated outside the classroom while still in next to the garbage can for non-persons, non-humans is what they are treated like. And I thought, and I still think, that those kinds of efforts to risk, you can risk embarrassment, to show your students that child, I named him Little Emma because I, students told me about a little cartoon person. I said, Little Emma, <laughs> there he is, let's call him Emma. Let's give him a name. So you give these children a name, their imaginary children. What is it like to feel that pain? What is it like to feel left out? That's a simple thing. That's a social studies trick. That's not high class theory. But well, my hojam, Richard Brogio, told me, if you can't do it that, you ain't doing nothing. And that's how he would say it. I'll finish up. And I'll move down to my paper and come back um, for questions now, just in a moment. Let me just round this out. So, when I talk, um, I try to show something or demonstrate something that, however wrong I may be, how embarrassed I get, or mistaken I am, without my effort to know, to truly know, to create community, democratic community in a classroom, how can I have a chance? How could I have a chance two years ago, four years ago, six? Much less a chance now when I've got to think about ways to do it, maybe online, maybe online. And maybe that online environment isn't as splendid as this one. This is splendid. The job is ours, though, is yours. I don't know how to do it. I don't say it will be easy. But this kind of organizing starts by organizing a classroom, one classroom at a time, one child at a time, one life at a time. Those teachers are your students. They pay to the Commonwealth. Their families and communities pay for us to help them. And they are up against big enemies in this new disease, in this new racist reaction, this new fascism. I hesitate to use that word too many times because then it'll become too common for me. We have to understand, however, that that kind of life is waiting. But that we have public rooms to work in if we don't work with kids. And remember that we stand on blood. The blood is on the floor. It was shed by many poets, singers, artists, literary people, scientific workers, all workers. 
all teachers. We must know that we are workers and not be afraid to get shoulder to shoulder down in communities, in community with workers who might have something to teach us. Thank you. Any questions or thoughts? Hey guy, thank you. I'm so glad that technology gives this opportunity to us to meet here again. It's, it's a different way for us, but uh, I'm, I'm really yeah. very, very glad to, to have you here. Hi, Jamie. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And we, we all remembered all those, uh, those days that we, we were together here in Turkey, here or there and your memories, your, your observations, and your experience in Turkey uh, really made us very happy and made us rethink about everything, maybe our culture, maybe our schooling, our teachers, our, our experience, because you, uh, you made us see Turkey, Turkish culture, or everything here from your eye and we don't see everything you know every day, every day life uh, in the way you see it so it was very very good to uh, to have this again uh, for example the picture you you showed us the simichi guy you know the kid who, mm -hmm. who who sells Smith, press sell, and a, a woman walking, an advertisement. You know, we we see that every day, many times, many times. But we we never think that. Let's take a picture and let's analyze this. <laughs> so it's, it's it's very different. You 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 know, show us a mirror. Thank you. Thank you. You became a mirror for us. Uh, and also you called this, uh, this webinar series as a democratic project. Thank you. This is really very important for us. We, we want to keep this on. And also you, you said the, the global crisis, which maybe started here or there, wherever it is, have some common things, common problems. And you call that it is, it is beyond crisis. You know, George Floyd uh, issue and maybe the timing of it, it's coming just during, during the pandemic era while we, we are having already problems and then George Floyd things and you know it uncovered many problems and it's beyond crisis yes we have to think about that deeper maybe and now thanking again again and again I want to leave the leave the floor to Eda again maybe for having questions I don't know whatever it is Eda is here uh, so, Professor Sinise walked us through uh, Ankara education, social justice, streets in Turkey and also in Ankara. Now, as a you know, surprise for the participants and also for dear Guy and dear Jamie, I would like to show you some photos of our time together in Ankara. So, let me just share some photos. I think this will just, um, you know, pave the wave and, uh, you know, Remind us some great moments. Here comes the first picture. This is the latest edition of uh, School and Society. And the book that you mentioned with Fatma Hoca, Yasemin Hoca and you. And uh, welcome to 2013. <laughs> uh, we can see you in one of our seminar rooms in Ankara University, where actually we had great talks and uh, they took around actually 10 p.m. sometimes. Remember <laughs> we used to come up with a list 
uh, kilometers where you know people can you know drop each other as well so that we can have some more talks and uh, this is um, a seminar room in Middle East Technical University here again we gathered in our small resilience group within a seminar and we were enjoying your amazing music and our thoughts and uh, this is the poetry slam <laughs> again in our circle at Metu. This was a precious moment. Your precious comments and uh, articles in our uh, dear Elisha Kutakushi journal. And this is how we actually, you know, paved the way for, for a free evening again in one of our seminars with all the colorful, uh, you know, balloons and uh, art and the music. And this is the first <laughs> photo, actually, it, it dates back to third uh, critical pedagogy seminar held in Ankara University. Here we see other friends. Also, we would like to mention dear Professor Jerry Kutcher. Unfortunately, we heard that um, he had a sudden unexpected uh, you know, death. That's we would like to honor his memory as well. We met him. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm so sorry to be the bearer of the bad news. Oh, so sorry. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. What happened? Um, I, I, I heard that it was a sudden heart uh, problem. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. So, thank you very much for sharing the songs of freedom with us, uh, your songs of freedom with us again. Uh, I think we covered some of the questions. Uh, but we can have more maybe, Eda. Yeah, maybe, I mean, the speakers can unmute, say hi maybe, and then ask their questions. We have lots of friends here. We just try they to have a conversation, you know. Mm -hmm. We can turn this into a circle. And the time limit is uh, actually here, but we can have more uh, okay. conversation. Thank you very much. So if you would like to ask a question, you can type it on the chat box or please feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to unmute and say hi and ask your questions. Uh, Hasan Hajam says thanks to all. Thank you, Hajam. It is great to see you here. And Ayhan Hajam uh, says hi. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yasim Hajam, maybe you would like to say a few words. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Guy, for this great talk. You know, it was full of memories, so I was really emotional <laughs> here listening to it all. It was, as usual, very inspiring uh, and touching. Thank you very much indeed. And seeing all those things about Ankara University and Metu, you know, all those pictures. I didn't even know that you took those pictures, you know, of the reading woman <laughs> and the revolving doors and the library, you know. It's amazing. And some of our students with Zeynep in that room at Metu are here today with us. So yeah. they're listening to you. That's also amazing to see. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm really happy to be a part of this community. You know, we met with Zeynep and you and many others in Thessaloniki many years ago in the Critical Education Conference. And I'm really, really happy. I went to that conference and I met you. It changed my life in many respects. You know, it transformed my life. Um, to be a part of this community makes me really happy. Thank you all. You know, I, um, so many things are in my mind. Um, 
sadness uh, at uh, Jerry's death. I did not know him well, but I knew he stood for. I knew what he stood for. And I, I think about being invited. You know, uh, I, I I was in. I was in these public buildings. Uh, it's Don and Nudges uh, home. Um, the colleges. Uh, I was in. Uh, you know, the Yasmin facilitated so much to met to. These are public places, and important to know and remember the public owns them. And Ihan, I was, I visited with Ihan. Uh, his, I mean, this is a special to me, <laughs> but um, not most special, but just as special was uh, my opportunity to, to watch um, good critical pedagogy in high school classrooms with Zanuck and, and Birol. Um, I won't forget that, and I won't forget the modeling of the activity, the fellowship, the discipline, the, um, the warmth, the knowing, the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder work. I mean, that makes me feel like all of our work is so is synthetic, and that's why this whole community is so dear to me. And, uh, this long process, I'm very emotional. No, I'm sorry. Maybe now we can go on with um, some messages from the uh, participants. Uh, Naji Aksoy Hocam and Hasan Hussein Hocam uh, said hi, I think. I, I missed that. And Fahriye Hocam is here and she says hi. And now yeah. we, Yol Hocam is also here, Naji Handerce from our classes. And now we have a question from, uh, sorry, I, you have a nickname, I'm not so sure how to, you know, read it. Ayşe Gülrosa would like to ask a question. Okay, I, I, muted, I unmuted you. Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I would like to thank for the presentation, for, for your speech and sharing those photos and the, and the things behind that maybe, as um, Fatmo just said, I guess that we maybe wouldn't imagine in the daily life that we see every day. And then you brought out uh, the ideas behind that can be uh, hidden. Um, thanks for that. And I would like to tell a little, little, little story how I ended up in this seminar. Um, and then I would like to ask a question. Um, two years ago, uh, I was working in my office in Mecce, in Otto, uh, at Faculty of Education. And it was after, I don't know, 5, 6 or p.m., something. And then uh, my window was open. It was kind of summerish time. And then I was hearing some, somebody was reading a poem. And then uh, right after, I heard a clarinet. I was like, what's happening? And then I went to my window and I looked down, like looking around, where is that sound coming from? So there I have seen that uh, a little group are just gathered there and talking and reading poems. And I was so surprised to see such a thing. And it made my day that day. Uh, it was a long day, still working. And, and then I, I have heard this music. That's how I met this guru. Uh, thanks for that day, too. And for this seminar, um, Eda wrote me, sent me an email, thanks again, like thousands of times, really. Thank you for letting me know about this seminar. Uh, so that's how I came here. After that day, I met this group. I get in contact uh, through social media. And I guess a couple of times uh, I met the people, but not so much, but I'm happy that I'm here now. So my question is, uh, we are passing through really very interesting times, not just because of the COVID-19, but also the, um, uh, the rise of anti-fascist movement and the rise of, uh, uh, I don't know, like solidarity. So I would like to ask um, for you, in your opinion and with your experience, what would you like, would you like to say about what is the biggest hope uh, this time show to you for, for, for the future that we can carry on? Well, huh. 
I'm tempted. I'm really tempted to say I'm at the very edge of hope. Maybe I don't have any. The first thing I know that's important is not to be a liar. No, I will not lie. I am very worried. My hope is thin, but I think that the community building that I see in the streets, that I see in the media that we are using, is sword for solidarity is something to be hopeful about because it's a demonstration of the what what uh, John Dewey called the moral meaning of democracy as a way of life. And for Dewey, who I um, I learned so much about after I went to Turkey and how he worked very closely with Turkish educators to build a Republican system, to build a, uh, an idea that could be worldwide in the service of working people and working people's children. And Dewey really did say this, and, and I do believe it in his uh, pedagogic creed, that this effort to communicate is the way of life that brings joy and art into our lives as a shared moment. It makes my life meaningful today and thousands, millions of people who are worried, maybe close to hopeless, brings them together. This massive togetherness is everywhere. And it's just become an incredible power. Partly, I think, because there is an existential threat that we all share. We are reminded every day we are all the same. We all can get sick. We all can suffer. We all can die. And we will do it under conditions of nature, or we will do it under conditions of man-made oppression. And that is what these movements are about. And that is where to find hope. I do believe it. Thank you very much. So here is another question uh, by a dear colleague. Uh, Nurcan Uca would like to ask a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello and thank you for this beautiful webinar. Actually, it's not a question, but I just wonder your comments about that. Uh, you know, because of this COVID situation, um, we as teachers, as education edu educators, have been undergoing an, uh, an online teaching uh, process. So it has been overwhelming for us and we had to change everything very quickly. It was like an adapt or die situation, especially for those uh, who work in private institutions, because it turned into something like marketing, like a pres prestige for the universities. and. Um, Actually, I can say we adapted to this and now the classes are going online. We have online exams, online proficiencies and everything. So I just wonder, uh, under these circumstances, do you think uh, the language teachers are going to be the, the first ones to be sacrificed in the workforce? I mean, what, what do you think about the future of those uh, people in education area, especially for those language teachers, language educators. Can I ask you why you think the language teachers would be the first? Uh, because uh, it's maybe because of the uh, our ex because of our experience. Uh, it looks like if the situation continues like that, uh, the institution has a tendency to. Uh, have the classes online in terms of the language classes because uh, they are the most crowded ones generally and that's why the institution maybe uh, can have a policy like that and in that case I mean maybe the language teachers are going to be the first ones uh, uh, that we, we cannot maybe see the reactions of the students uh, anymore like that that's, yeah. that's, that's a kind of concern. 
maybe. Yeah, there is a concern. And I don't have an easy answer. I do know that I can't speak to it unless I can share it. And so one of the reasons I stay, I stay in the game is so I can continue to work with you all as a, as a retired professor. I am beginning my process of my work at a small community adult education center, college, online, online. And uh, I'm doing it and realizing now what that will take. I can't talk to you unless I understand what that will take to take everything. I have some experience with that because I was forced online by an institution that has used online education as a status symbol, as you said, but also as a way to automate labor, to automate everything, to make automate to make automatic right answers, wrong answers, to make syllabus, to make lessons automatic, so automatic that I am not required. I can be replaced. If there's a cheaper worker, they can teach my class that I authored, that I built. Welcome to the world of the ordinary worker. Welcome to their world, I say to myself. Because that automation, that concentration, has been a force that has accelerated the exploitation of workers pitting worker against worker, and pitting workers against machines. We are now in that world ourselves as teachers. It gives us more empathy and sympathy for those who are threatened by automation, unemployment, maybe being fired, or maybe being replaced. All I can say is it helps our sympathy, our empathy for them, because they are now us. And I'm not saying that's a sweet answer. It's not too sweet. It is a reality. <coughs> but <clears throat> that's how I think about it right now. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, Zainab, uh, Zainab would like to make a comment. Zainab. Zainab. Hello, Dai. <laughs> Uh, it was really emotional, as Yasemin and you all said, to remember all those things. And also, yes, uh, Jerry Kajur as well. Uh, but uh, I uh, remembered what I, li uh, I love most when I listen to you. Uh, when we listen to Guy Hojam, uh, we, uh, like, we are face to face with our uh, alienation and I love it uh, a lot because we all read the poem Bedava and I never thought of it as a symbol of language of freedom and whenever you remind, remind us this I uh, every time I feel yes yes in my classes I try to remember this and the second point but what I like most when I follow your courses and I uh, speech is uh, you remind uh, the importance of public places. And after this, I mean, uh, with this philosophy, uh, it changed my view to, towards schools. Schools are places, public places, where we can uh, give, although many, thing, many obstacles are there, yes, I accept, uh, especially in our country uh, during this five, last five years, but still schools are public places that we can, I mean, create an atmosphere uh, for the students, for the young people. And uh, I love that you reminded it again. So I wanted to thank you, Kojam. Thanks a million. Uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you Zane. I have one thought and one comment about that. You know, and this, uh, this makes you think differently when, you have a life, a life, a life that goes on, and it does not go backwards. I'm 68 years old. You know, I think about mortality, and I think about uh, um, everything related to the meaning 
the meaning of my life and looking at it and why it, and why it, if it has meant anything I mean, I mean it's in it's not separated from the meaning that your friendship and the friendship of all our friends um, has meant to me you know the great um the great foundational idea, and I don't want to get too, into theoretical position too much, but it's very important, really. The great theoretical foundation of, 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 of justice, our, our, our search for justice, is founded in a question, I believe, and many others, too, um, believe, that was asked um, in Plato's Republic uh, uh, when... Uh, Socrates talks about knowing your friends and your enemies. And the friend and enemy distinction has become a foundation for how we think about justice. The friend, the enemy, who is my real friend and how I am often usually mistaken. I make mistakes about who my enemies are. The people in the streets fighting in every country, in every era, are full of mistaken enemies, people who don't know the love of their enemy because they are prevented from seeing it in that prevention of vision. And so the vision, building imagination and vision is something we can do um, because it's our job. <laughs> and we can think and we can know, you know, these children, they are not, they are professional friends we love them professionally, but there's true heart in it. There's true heart. And that heart is what makes our lives go. And at 68, you look back on what made your life go and what, what, it, what it meant and what it mat how it mattered. That's also something we give to our students because they're on their life trajectory and they are giving meaning to their lives and partly by sorting out and understanding what a friend means. And when an enemy is why that enemy exists and how we are all human. And if we can understand that, we may win some good looking back at our lives. So, you know, it's, um, you know, these publics, I know, Zanuck, what you mean, you know, I, I grew up, my mind matured in colleges that taught us the institutions the public institutions that we have, they're designing, their orchestra leader is capital, is big business. And John Dewey knew this. And Dewey said, uh, yes, that is true. That does not change the fact, that does not change the fact that we keep a close eye on those who would like to use our schools, public, but also private for their personal friends. Make you an enemy rather than a friend in order to exploit you. The way we inter interfere with that is by this friendship and knowing both each other as peers and adults, but also children. And we can do that in a public space despite and also because these public spaces have been hijacked too often and today by power, hijacked by power. What can we do? We can show up to work. You know, I remember, Hassan, I remember a, a comment uh, that you made a long time ago. We were in the, in the hallway at Ankara University and uh, I was first there and I was overwhelmed with thinking and wondering what in the world do, can I understand about about all this and how do what do I do next and you were busy running to another class and you had a pile of books and and, and I said I said something like uh, so Hassan how do you do it you know it's eight o'clock at night and you gotta get up to the next day how, I mean how do you do it and you turned to me and just said it's my job <laughs> you know I remember that all this time because you thought of yourself as hey the public gives me work to do I've got to do this work and being a worker, just being a worker, just saying, hey, let's clear my head. I've got, I, have a, I really have a job and it's a lot of work, 
but I'm showing up and I'm doing my job as a worker. And we don't forget that we are workers. And we have a job. I like that. I always remember that. What are you doing at public schools, Ana? You show up. <laughs> you know, you got a it's a job. And it's it's but it's interesting because it's not a job that's totally controlled by power. It is also under your control in many important ways. Many ways. Now, how to make that ownership real online? I think it might be possible. I don't know. I'll find out in, in the fall. I know okay, you guys are I, uh, What I, time is it there? It's late. What time is it? Can I ask you a question? Maybe the last question, Guy? Can I ask you, I, just ask you, what time is it? 9.40. Right. Sorry. Uh, I, I, am, I am asking this question on behalf of this group, or, or more than this group. Uh, many people are wondering where, when are you coming to Turkey? I'll be on the next plane. Oh, with a, with a mask on. You'll be, you will be in quarantine 15 days, you know. <laughs> I know. In a student dormitory. Well, yeah, I was, so I was given a choice this fall. My, my department chair said, so guy, do you want to teach some live students and part online, part live? Or do you just want to teach online? And you guys know how much I love working with people. But I said, Francisca, I want to teach online because that's the only way I can go to Turkey. Oh. Oh my God. <laughs> I hope. I hope. I don't hope. I plan, if it's at all possible, to come and just uh, hang out and drink coffee. Yeah. Okay. okay, we are looking forward to it. And Rocco. Looking forward too. to see you and Jamie. And Jamie, would you like to say a few words? and? Uh, you really uh, yeah. this, this for me also this was so emotional to hear guy talk he just imagine living with him huh. <laughs> he is a, i i can see how, how you, you see the picture of the advertisement and people walking so many times i was, uh, up, I was up all night so many times <laughs> I, I have had the very good fortune as a social worker to be working right in the midst of, of so many meaningful things with people. And I, I would come home and it would be meaningful to me and I would share some with Guy. But Guy is able to look at things, pull things out and change make my head go this way looking at it he is it has been wonderful to hear him talk but i have to say seeing you there this feels as if we are there with you i can't believe this can feel that way but to see this is a community here i it this gives me hope I, I don't feel hopeless. I, I see smiling faces that I know. I see serious faces that are concerned about this. I can't believe it, but technology actually may give us an opportunity to keep community alive. And, and I know that times are not good and very strong powers would love to squash this kind of thing. But this is exactly what keeps the possibility for change alive. So thank you. 
thank you for including me with this. It is so wonderful to see you guys. It's just, it's I so think nice. I see Zainab. Are those your orange curtains in the background? Yes, I have been in that room. She has an orange couch too. I just feel like we are there and and we will go there and we will stay in an apartment below Fatma and we're back. <laughs> and if it's still vacant. <laughs> friendship as well as causes and colleagues. Genuine friendship. And it's been so for great. All. It's been so <laughs> great that people come and visit us and I want to say when are you all coming here? <laughs> yes. Come to the belly of the beast. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen Farhia. Farhia was here. Yasmin was here. So, come here. Help. Help yes. us. <laughs> there are some other we do. There are some other comments and uh Hardal Gular says thank you and uh Sorry, Tuğçe Arikan Hocam says, thank you as well with Birol Hocam. And Yasemin uh, Hoca has a great comment here. Uh, Yasemin Hocam, would you like me to share it or would you like to share yourself? We would like to hear you. Please share it, Eda. <laughs> okay. Uh, Yasemin Hoca says, I think Global Thursday talks are the source of hope. Thank you for organizing the talk. It reminded me of our collaboration, community, and the power of language of freedom. It was about, I was about to forget some of those under the quarantine. This is solidarity. Thank you, Hajam. Thank you. Thank you, Yasin. And Janda Nazar. Working on your dissertations. Just get it down. <laughs> <laughs> right. Get it um, down. We will be meeting following day as well. And you joining. Yeah. Please follow us on social media so that uh, you can follow the posters and the updates and the events. Uh, we are on Facebook and uh, Instagram. And uh, I, I put it on the chat box. I would like to put it again. You know, me and my, uh, I'd like to thank to my students, my PhD students, master's students, and our research assistants, some of them always support us by being here and we are we are getting a bigger fa family yeah. with your support thank you and if you would like to uh, get um you know the overall reviews and also the papers shared by our speakers please send us an email and we would be really happy to share them with you maybe this will go on with the reading circle i don't know uh, as Yasemin Hocam said, this is solidarity and it will grow. Also, happy to share our email, my email. Also, Jamie, I think, is happy to share for, you know, questions or conversations. So, feel free to share that. Thank you. Okay, now we can close, I, I guess, Eda. Yeah, we can say our goodbyes, I guess. <laughs> Thank you everyone for showing up. It has been Thank you. Thank you very much, Bye. Guy, and thank you very much, Jamie. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. See you soon. <laughs> I hope.